Well, alrighty, gang. Welcome back to the Active Self Protection Podcast. I am yet again your host, Mike Willover, and I remain your favorite former Fed. With me today is a man who's uh, a video of whose I watched a badge cam and dash cam video not long ago. Download the ASP Unlimited app for all the content you love from Active Self Protection and more with no interference from YouTube. No ads, no age gates, exclusive videos, seminars, classes, and more on iOS, Android, Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, and Android TV. Hit the link in the description or download Asp Unlimited from your app store today. And I absolutely loved every second of it. Um, he had a conversation with a young man that I had had a uh, number of occasions in my career trying to help him uh, it, it, with future interactions with law enforcement. Anyway, uh, his name is Eric Kirsch. He is the under sheriff at what's the name of the county, Eric? I don't want to mispronounce it. It's, well, it's okay. Well, Buncey County, Kansas. It, right, We're located right Kansas. Between, uh, to, between Topeka and Manhattan. So Okay. I, I know where that is. I'll, so I'll be driving mm -hmm. through there in September. I think we spoke before I hit the record button that uh, we will be active self protection. will be out there the first week of September for the Flint Hills foster teen camp and our national Great. conference. So hopefully we will see Eric while we're there. That would be nice or get a meal or something. <laughs> Excuse me. He's married with one daughter and I'm going to see if I can just have John do a bonus video where we can do something to show that video of yours on our main channel. Um, I don't know if you know, we have a little over 3 million subscribers and we get, you know, regularly hundreds of thousands of views. And I think this is a great video to show the general public. Um, why don't you just kind of walk us through what happened in the video? Because it'd be better coming from you. You were there. I wasn't. Sure. So it was, we have a small agency. There's 10 sworn. So even as under sheriff, as the executive officer, uh, as the mom, I still conduct patrol when a deputy needs coverage. And I was on patrol for an overnight shift. And I uh, had a vehicle in front of me. It was on I-70. We've got over 20 miles of I-70 in the county. So America's Main Street cuts through. So we do quite a bit of interdiction on the highway and uh, as, as well as normal rural law enforcement opportunities and things that come with a uh, small town. And anyway, I-70 is a, uh, we have all manner of different things that come off of it. But I was on patrol. It was back in April and early morning. I think it was some, sometime between 4 and 5 a.m. And I had a vehicle in front of me, which initially appeared to be a, a 1046 driver. So uh, an inebriated driver had failure to maintain mm -hmm. lane, difficulty maintaining speed, and just caught my attention. There wasn't a lot of traffic out anywhere. Um, it was a white and color Toyota, Kansas Tags. But uh, I, I don't remember the exact play-by-play, -play, but he, made a, he was in the, the fast lane. I was behind him for about half a mile, observing his inability to maintain lane. And he finally didn't use the turn signal, got over to the right lane. And then as I was passing him, he sped up and kind of matched my speed, which is fine. It, it happens. And uh, I looked over and um, couldn't see who was in there, but I saw a cell phone in someone's hand and there was texting activity going on. So I, I hung back and uh, initiated a traffic stop. The vehicle pulled over, made contact. And when I made the approach, uh, one thing I noticed early on was the young man, his hands were both out the window, the passenger side, or excuse me, the driver's side of the vehicle, mm -hmm. which is if we're telling someone to do that, that's, that's a, uh, that's one thing, but to have that happen naturally um, it's unusual and it's not a, it's, it gave me an indicator of this is either someone who's used to um, police encounters like, that are of a, a felony car stop nature, or mm -hmm. it was someone who was scared or it was someone who was, you know, I don't know, habituated to the system. So the, uh, I asked him, I introduced myself as I do on every stop. I try to do every single stop I, as identical as possible, just to get that muscle memory down mm -hmm. and introduced myself, asked him if he knew why I was stopping him. And the young man, he, grabbed his cell phone from the center console and with a very furtive movement um, pointed it at me. And it was, I didn't know it was a cell phone at first. And as he was, as he looked away down to where he was grabbing, I just instinctively went down. I had my, my hand on my duty weapon and I was about to, as he was moving towards me in that, you know, that nanosecond of sorts, I was, I was about to draw down on him and, I hit the brakes of my mind and, and realized what was going on and noticed I didn't feel an impact on my vest. And then there was no right. sound of a, of a gunshot. And, uh, 
so I, you know, I said, okay, that was, that was interesting. And the full video, it's, um, it's not that much longer than the video that we released because it is a good training opportunity. It was a good, uh, I, I think a good demonstration of, of how you maybe should act instead of some of these tragedies we see unfold on mm -hmm. these, uh, these body camera videos that are continuously come out of uh, different agencies throughout the country. So um, obtained his information, went back to my vehicle, ran his information through dispatch. The plate was current. It was a rental car, which was unusual. Uh, he had a current license, uh, no active wants or warrants. Everything was good with that. And then once I determined he was not intoxicated, I, uh, I asked him to step out and he did. And um, I informed him first and foremost, you're not in any trouble. However, don't you ever point anything like that to, to an officer in that manner, please, please, please. It was a, mm -hmm. you know, there was not so much an adrenaline rush with me, but I just was going through the, what possibly could have happened in the worst case scenario for him, for anybody. And uh, he was a young black male. He's an active duty soldier. There's a, to be, there's a, there's an additional thing with that. The race is, is part of, uh, the equation, the context on, on stops, it really is. And, and I think if people don't take that seriously, they're, they're sort of lying to themselves mm -hmm. um, where you come from and your previous interactions. And that will shape the way you act with law enforcement. I've had, I'm sure you as you've had as well before, during and after you've been a LEO peace officer that you've had bad interactions with, with law enforcement. So um we had a very good talk on the side of the road. I got to find out more about him, about his, uh, where he's from a little bit, you know, as much as he could in a, in a, in a traffic stop because he, I didn't want to prolong the stop more than I needed to, to understand. He was absolutely not intoxicated. He was on a cell phone. He admitted to, to being on his phone. And it was a great opportunity for me to say, please and thank you. Do not ever make a movement like that because there's a famine in, in training as we spoke before we started recording, I think uh, nationwide it's for a multitude of reasons, but uh, we perform at the highest level of our training. I'm in a unique situation where um, I was a Marine officer and then uh, had several combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan as military and also as a, a contractor. And I was a former NCIS special agent. So quite a bit of training, both in the Marine Corps and NCIS and here in rural law enforcement where we, we train and then we train and we train and we train and we train. And we train. Um, you have to take the time and the initiative to, to actually do that. So you, you get, you're performing at the highest level of your training. And I don't know, I just didn't want to see, I wanted there to be a, an opportunity for a lesson to be learned for, for him. And also um, have to have a good contact with, with him too. He, he shared a little bit about his, uh, where he came from and how, in, which was uh, the state of Georgia. And I, we didn't get a chance to have like a long nuanced conversation, but it was very clear and apparent to me that he was nervous and he was apprehensive and he probably hadn't had a lot of great experiences with cops before. And I just the same, I haven't either. Um, I've had some horrific experiences when I was a kid coming up in New York uh, with cops and great ones too, but the bad ones, you remember those. You don't really remember yep. the great ones. You do remember the bad ones. So how do you present yourself? It's a lot of it's on us too. You know, we're, we're in control of the stop and we have the ability to either have a, a good outcome or a terrible one based on what the officer does. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to ask if, if you got the information about where that young soldier was from, I assume he's probably from Fort Riley, right? From being that close yes, to Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it does make a difference. Um, I was able to, in my career, as, as I'm, I guess you probably were as well, able to work in different parts of the country, which is a real privilege to be able to kind of compare and contrast the difference between, you know, Southern California and Arizona and Maryland and Florida and other places I was sent on detail to and the, the, the training thereof. Another thing we talked about before we hit the record button and you, you alluded to it uh, a moment ago is, you know, I, I, I do get the sense and I, who knows if my perspective is any good or not, because I'm constantly watching critical incident videos. I'm not, you know, no one's sitting around watching hours of boring badge cam and dash cam where nothing happens. Right. So oh, I don't yeah, know if my perspective not. is skewed because I'm constantly watching these videos, but I get the sense anecdotally, at least that over the last few years, the quality of the training or the quality of the hiring process or something has started to really erode in a significant way because I, I just don't, I feel like I didn't see this many bad incidents, um, you know, 15 or 20 years ago as I do now. When I say bad incidents, I mean like we, we've got 
a couple of New York City police uh, NYPD videos uh, that are really good. We have a couple that are awful, just terrible, where there's two cops wrapped up with a bad guy who's got a gun and the, the third or fourth, third and fourth cop are shooting sort of wildly into the middle of all these bodies that are entangled up on the floor or shooting their partner in the back because they're, they're not they're just panic firing. Um, if you had to make a, a guess, if you had to take a wild guess as to what what has changed, is it defund the police? Is it nobody wants to do this job anymore so we can't get better qualified candidates? Is it lack of training or, or is it a combination of all those things in your opinion? 